And I'm telling you, I mean, what was I telling you? At 38 years old, I had lost everything. You know, I wanted to go. Hi, everyone. Michael here and time for another podcast. And, you know, I don't get to choose who comes on my podcast. People are sent to me. They contact me. I might invite a few. And sometimes, you know, strange circumstances get people to me to be on the podcast. And whether you believe in it or not, there is some other force that we don't know is at work that censors people. And this is this particular podcast is one such case because I connected with Monique McKinnon and I'm really grateful to Monique for connecting with me on LinkedIn. And I invited Monique to come on the podcast. And for one reason or another, we just didn't get it together, did we, Monique? And you also then introduced me to Marie Helene to suggest that she came on the podcast. And she did agree, and she's been on the podcast. You're going to hear from her. And it's just a remarkable uh, course of events that happened for her to come on the podcast. And it's been such an amazing, wonderful discussion I've had with her. It's longer than my normal 45 minutes to an hour, but actually there are so many amazing messages that are coming from her. And her story is also just amazing. And, and we're very lucky to have Marie Helene on the podcast because like a couple of years ago, she was very nearly not on this planet anymore. So have a listen see what messages you receive from her because you, you really want to listen to this podcast all the way through. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Marie Helen. How are you today? I am doing really well. How about you? Oh, fantastic. And you are in Canada, right? We, oui, that's right. We, oui. and I'm in the UK. <laughs> so, and, and obviously you've got some kind of French, which I, I would love to hear the whole story behind that and um, how that all works in Canada with the two languages. <laughs> but, yeah. So really great to have you. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you. And uh, if you've listened to any of my previous podcasts, I always start with the same question, and that is for you to share a little bit about your personal life. So, mm -hmm. for example, where were you born? Um, where were you educated? Then, you know, did you move around? Mm -hmm. And maybe a bit about your family, whatever you wish to share, your hobbies and interests. So over to you. Sounds good. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. I'm very honored. Um, Pleasure. It's very, uh, yeah, it's very exciting. <clears throat> so, yes, I am from Canada. Uh, I was born uh, in Quebec City. Um, most people will know more like Montreal, right? Mm. So, so it's about, I want to say, uh, a good two, two hours and a half, two hours from Montreal. Um, and, um, my first language is French. So pardon my, um, some of my maybe English mistakes that will come up. I might even need your help once in a while. <laughs> oh, it's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. And, um, yeah, so I did most of my, um, um, studying, uh, in Quebec city in Canada. And, um, what I did was, um, you know, do the whole normal schooling, all of that. Although in, in your country, my country, I believe it's different a little bit. Mm. Um, so the high school part was where things started to change a bit for me. Um, I did a um, program that was called um, um, art, um, sports, arts and study. So um, what it combines is that we are um, a small group of people that is being handpicked to be part of a program where we uh, go to school in the morning. So our high school 
uh, was only 200 people. Wow. Which is not the norm. Yeah. So it was very small. And uh, we would go to school in the morning. And then in the afternoon after lunch, everybody would go to their respective activity because what we wanted out of this, um, everybody was there to go um, hopefully professional in either a sport, either an art, um, either music or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So um, I had the privilege to go with, you know, some um, some people that went to the Olympics and uh, wow. just, it, yeah, it was really phenomenal. And uh, what I uh, went um, into was dance. Um, so that was my first uh way of communication, um, definitely with, through the body. Mm -hmm. So I, um, did this for five years. Um, it was quite challenging. I was not always the, the best in school. Um, but you had to have good marks to be in that program, knowing that your marks would go down. Right. Yes. So I worked my butt off. <laughs> Uh, I cried over math, chemistry, and science, which I'm terrible at. Mm. Oh, my gosh. Um, but anyway, and, you know, the dancing part of the in the afternoon was about, um, it would go from maybe uh, 1 o'clock to about 5 o'clock. And yeah. that would be five days a week. Wow. So that was quite intensive, yeah. Um, but did you, um, did you enjoy that bit more, the dancing, to balance out from the maths and chemistry and all of that? Oh, I or? had no interest with the maths and chemistry. No. <laughs> I was there only for the dancing. <laughs> yeah, so, so at least five days a week you managed to get what you really loved doing rather than that other stuff. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and dance was definitely, um, you know, what I'll get into it maybe a little later, but was uh, what saved me uh, more than once in my life. Uh, movement and, like I said, like the way of communicating yes. through a different way. Yeah. yeah. Um, so after that, I just wanted to continue into dancing and mm. wanted to go into professional Um so I continued into a program. So we have some kind of a program. It's called CEGEP. So, of course, it was in French. Mm -hmm. And it's between high school and between university for us. Yes. Uh, it's like more like a college, I guess. Um, and um, so I decided to go into dance, and it was mostly modern dance that I did. Yes. Uh, we loved it. It was very earthy, uh, very... Uh, getting really in touch with some really deep emotions, uh, quite different than ballet, you know? Mm, mm. Um, and is, I needed it at that time. And is this more, did you have a partner or did you dance on your own or in a group or how was that? So it continued to be, uh, it was an all day thing, five days a week, mm. uh, where you would come and continue taking classes. So we were into groups, you know, uh, in class. And then I'd, we would have some classes where we would have some partnering work. And what I mean by that, not so much partnering like lifting and all that, mm. but it was more par partnering um uh, it, there was more female than male, so <laughs> mm. we did a little more partnering and, and collabor collaboration in our dances, and choreography started to kick in more and more as we advanced in the program. Because at the end of yeah, at the end of all this, we ended up having a degree as a professional dancer. Yeah. Mm hmm. So that was the the early stage of studying, and truthfully, I tried to go to university. I tried to go. I went into, um, you know, the history of arts and it was just not for me. No. The school system was just not me. Mm -hmm. um, was never, it was never part of, I was never able to be part of it because there was no space for me and the way I am to feel like I was a, um, intelligent competent uh person in there because what i was good at my abilities were totally different in what schooling wanted mm. Do, does that make sense totally because at the end of the day schools are i we, we have an expression i don't know if you've come across it where people are sheep dipped you know everybody's treated in the same way 
yeah. that you may have some differences. I mean, the same problem exists with people that have learning difficulties, but if somebody's a little bit different and is more inclined to be wanting to do arts, um, the schools just can't cater for that. You know, you have to go to exactly. be very specialist and people, people don't understand that actually, well, forget about all the kind of maths and science and mm -hmm. business studies. And if somebody wants to do art, that, that's where they need to go. They need to do art or dance or theatre or music or... In, in fact, I don't know if you know this, there's, um, there's a guru in India. I don't know if you come across him. He's called Sadguru and spelled S-A-D-G-H-U-R-U. I'll yeah, have to look him up. Yeah, he has a YouTube channel. He's, he's an amazing guy and he's one of my favourite teachers at the moment. And a, a friend kind of business client introduced me to him and and he has set up a school in India where I think they may have to do a little bit of maths and English. That's it. The rest mm -hmm. of it is all the arts. It's painting, it's oh drawing. My God. <laughs> this is for little children go there. Medi oh. Meditation, yoga. There's like, he goes into a room, he said, and there's like 50, seven year olds, eight year olds oh meditating Amazing. together. And it's, it's just, he is creating the future schooling in India. Yes. And, you know, people learning the arts because it does so much for your brain power. Oh my God, yes. And it does so much for, um, in my case, um, there was a lot of trauma in my life. And that was how, as a young kid and then as a teenager, and then as a young adult, I was able to let go so much because trauma gets stored into your tissues, right? Into your body. Right. And um, often we think it's the speaking part, you know, that will, and, and of course it helps, you know, therapy and all of that stuff. And um, and I've, I've done it and I'm still in therapy. I mean, I think everybody should be in actually. Yeah. Um, and, um, but, but the, the physical part is the part that I think most people forget. Um, you need to let it out, out of your, the issue needs to come out from your tissue, you know? Mm, mm. <laughs> Yeah. I like so that. I will have to quote that. The issue has to come out of your tissue. <laughs> right. And it's the last layer from what I've learned in my own healing, right? So, yeah. So that's that's what I did. And I received that degree. I continued with it. Mm -hmm. um, I got a few gigs, but my dream was to be a professional dancer, go out there, travel the world. Yes. Um, and I did get to travel the world, uh, with, uh, a small group called, well, small, it's not small, actually, it's big. It's called Up With People. Have you ever heard of them? No. So Up With People, um, is from the United States and, uh, it is, they travel all over the world and, um, it, it was like a little bit of a college for life, you know, yes. we would travel, we would be, um, between 100 to 120 young kids, um, between 18 and 25 at the time. Uh, so for me, it was in 1996 uh, that I did that right after graduating from high school in 1995. And I actually did that in between, you know, after high school, before I get into uh, um, more schooling with dance. And so we travel the world. Um, we have a show. So I would dance in it. Um, we had a show. Everybody had a different part to do. The show was the traveling tool, you know, and to spread a message. So it was the youth was coming from, uh, we were like, like I said, about 100 kids from 25 different countries traveling together for a full year. Mm. It was amazing. It was the, some of the best years of my life. And we would stop into each city. We would live in host families. So we would live in, in the culture, you know. I remember going, going to Poland, and here I am, you know, in a small little room with Polish people that don't even speak English. And I have to figure out how to get to my, my, uh, my stop in the morning, you mm. know. And it's just the best, you know. And 
Um, and then you would go into, you know, Denver, Colorado, and I would end up in a huge mansion. And you're like, wow, you know, you go from sleeping on the floor to going in a mansion. It's just insane. And we would do community service as well and everywhere we go. But the message was about um, bringing, um, bringing people who are different together and understanding that we all are the same at the end and to really bridge, you know, those differences and make them stronger by just combining and collaborating together. So it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And you express that through dance then? Yeah. So you would get picked, you know, for whatever part they needed you. And I did that through dance. So it was quite different. It wasn't modern dance. Mm. It was more, um, it was more like, um, um, what's it called? Um, I can't remember the way style, you know? Mm. So it was super fun. And we did lots of cultural dancing as well. So got to learn a lot about myself. And, and then I ended up working with the company for two years and met my husband. Wow. <laughs> we were really young. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I was the dancer and it was the lighting designer and it was so, it, it was a wonderful time. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. And and so what were you doing when you were working for them then when you said for two years? What what mm -hmm. role? So I ended up being a dance captain. So I ended up just um taking care of uh the cast. We, there was always a male and a female and we would take care of the cast. Um the cast of about a hundred people and we had to teach them the dances. We right. had to teach and we had to teach kids, you know, and teenagers that never had danced. I remember this football player that had never done anything. And mm. at the end, he ended up being one of our best dancers. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's what we did. And um, and then what yeah. happened? And where was the, was the job in Canada that you did? No, we did no. it all over the place. So we did about, from what I remember from my travels, I think I did 35 states in the United States. Mm. I did um, 10 provinces in Canada um, and I did 11 countries in Europe. Mm. Yeah. Wow, so that, sounds that's incredible. What, I know, and I was only 18 when I started and I didn't speak a word of English. <laughs> it was like, I remember having a massive headache, yeah. massive headache and oh good Lord, I couldn't, I, I was 18, and the thing, you learn English here, right, in mm, Quebec, mm. but um, it's not the the first language, and you don't get to practice. No. Nobody practices it. So, truthfully, I learned real English when I started traveling. You know, Absolutely. Right here, right here. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the best way, isn't it? When you're forced into yes. a situation where yes. you have to use a language to get by, that's the exactly. best opportunity to learn. I mean... I learned English in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. That's where I'm from originally. Oh, I didn't um, know that. That's great. Yeah, and we learned English at school. And actually, because my mother was Anglo-Indian, um, oh, wow. and my father worked for an American company, they spoke English in the home all the time. You have subtitles on. We, when we watched TV programs, they were in English, but with subtitles. So we had we had a great grounding. But when I then came to the UK... I was 17 and they said, right, you need to continue studying. I said, I haven't got the confidence in the language to be able to study in English. Mm. So I went to work uh, where I could use Dutch and English. And of yeah. course, I had to use English then in the workplace. And of course, you learn it so quickly then because you have to yeah. use it. Um, yeah. So it's fabulous. more fun too, right? Pardon? It's more fun yeah. that way too. Absolutely, yeah. And everybody, you know, you think you're making a fool of yourself, but everybody helps you. You know, people are so mm -hmm. great when it comes to languages. So, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So, so you did all your traveling, you were a dance captain, you did all of these countries, you found your husband. Then what happened next? <laughs> Well, well, my husband and I traveled for a little bit together and then we got split into two different casts and we were 20 years old. Mm. So at that point, we kind of said, well, you know, we're too young to commit while you're in, you know, 
China and I'm in like Ireland. You know mm. what I mean? Yeah. So we decided to separate at that point, but um, we uh, we always kept in touch. And um, so after that, um, the company, um, so it, it ended at some point, the company actually went through a little bit of a hard time and had to close and, and then um, well, take, a, take a break, I guess. They didn't fully close because they're back now. But then it was about, okay, what do I do next, right? What do I want to do next? And because for me, I always wanted to dance. So it was yes. about looking for the next the next opportunity to dance. And I ended up going to the United States and try to make it there. And it, um, it, it didn't, um, it didn't happen. It just didn't happen. Lots happened during that time. Mm. Um, uh, more on a, on a personal side. So it's my fan, the family part comes with me forming my business so i'm waiting for that part a little long later <laughs> mm -hmm. okay no problem yeah but then uh what happened is that 9 11 happened and i was in the united states when that happened oh, and wow. yeah and i at that point it was very clear i needed to come back i felt it really strongly but i had nowhere to go no job no nothing um and uh that that, that was the weirdest thing and the coincidence that happened there, which I don't believe on in anymore, coincidences, you know? Yeah. Um, is that I had sent out so many uh, different resume in the United States and then all of nowhere um, from Ottawa, so in Ontario, Canada, um, I get a phone call and there's this gentleman wondering if I would be interested in a job being a resident choreographer for a ballet company in Ottawa. Wow. And here it is. I am, uh, you know, ask, he was asking me, can you do it? Would you want to do it? And all this. And I had learned something when I was young. I had heard it somewhere, I think, from my grandfather. And he had said, you know, if you don't know how to do something, but you have an opportunity, you say yes. And then you get busy learning how to do it. Yes. So that's what I did. I said, yes, I can do this. And then I ended up moving back to Canada. That mm. brought me back in the country, which I, it needed to happen. Um, and so I had a job. I had nowhere to stay. Um, everything was backward, but <laughs> it's fine. It all ended up happening. Uh, I didn't know how to do the job, but I learned how to do the job. And I did it for six years. And it was amazing. I ended up working with um, children at that point. Um, the age range was between, you know, um, I had some three years old all the way to maybe 20. Wow. And I was, yeah, I was 80 of them. And I had to put up a show that would go, you know, into a real theater twice yeah. a year. <laughs> so it was about, I had to design the costumes, the, the sets, I had to design, um, the music, I had to put it together, um, all the moves. So it was a total production. I wasn't just doing the dance. So the creative part of me got like, whew, it was amazing. So you it's know? not just the choreography alone. It was the whole production, the directing yes. and everything. Yes. I think I might have said no if they had, they had told me that part. Yeah. <laughs> so good thing they never did. But uh <laughs> It ended up being a very successful part of my life and successful, not just in the way that society, you know, wants to relate to it, mm. um, but in really successful and in opening my heart and really bringing uh, some abilities that I had never looked at. Mm. And like I told you at the beginning, my dream was always to be a dancer and here comes the but, but I was always being pulled in into teacher's role, like mm. from life. And I always resisted it. I was like, no, I want to be a dancer. Like I want to travel the world, I want to be on stage. Yes. But I'd always being pulled in into the teacher's role until I realized in my 20s, I was like, you know what? Yes, maybe I have a passion for dance, but maybe this is not what my mission is for this life on so, earth right now. Mm, you stopped fighting it then. Yeah. yeah, and then I went along with it. Mm. Brilliant. And which now makes total sense, you know. Then, then everything started to really 
unfold and the abundance in many ways started to really come to me in that way. So that was great. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. And so what, what did you take away apart from saying, right, this is my mission then to be teaching others mm -hmm. to be doing the dance and creating all of that production. So did you see that working for that company was going to be a long-term thing? Um, I know. No. I knew that it was not going to be it. I knew there was more. Mm. Um, since I was a child, I've always been, uh, so that's where we kick in into the entrepreneur part. Yes. <laughs> so, um, of course I did a lot of jobs, you know, I had to get some money. So I did the whole work at a gas station, being made into, uh, you know, a really big prestigious uh, hotel in Quebec city. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I worked and did so many jobs and, but then I, I ended up just realizing that teaching wasn't just one thing. Um, Sorry, I'm going to back up on that one. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So one of my first job actually was when I was, uh, I think, 12 years old, and I had my home fruit and vegetable stand. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> and I was working alone. I had, that was the whole summer, loved it, did it for a few years. Mm. Um, I had my little pen and paper you know, and just would write down, did my little, what I now know as a spreadsheet, yeah. <laughs> um, but was never a math person. Remember that? So, yeah, I remember. <laughs> the, yeah. So I was doing all that, but, and it's funny how now I look back and I've always been an entrepreneur. Mm. I did not fit into working for someone. I did not fit in with corporation. I just, there was this pool of always having my own um, signal up in the up in the air, you mm. know, of energy being that's me. This mm. is what I have to offer the world, you know. And uh, so I did, you know, little jumps like that. But here's the thing: I never realized I was actually having little businesses. Mm. I was being an entrepreneur. Yeah. I never realized that part because I moved on from that to all of a sudden, um, I did, uh, some, um, so as a dancer, I realized my brother was a figure skater at a high level in Canada. And then I was watching figure skating. I'm like, who is teaching those kids how to use their arms and expression? Like really? And like a lot of them are not doing it. Mm. So I went into rinks all of a sudden and I started to offer my services and that just skyrocketed. Like I, I just started to do that full time and I was teaching kids and teenagers and athletes, you know, yes. of just the starting one and the ones that were on a uh, national and international level, how to tap into their uh, heart, how to tap into their their ability of being, it's called like in, in French, it's patinage artistique, which is, you know, artistic is art. So yes. where's the art part? Like, mm. so I taught them and that was my business, but I never realized it was a business. I just did it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had all those little jobs happening. I was like, wow, okay. And, uh, and then the funniest thing happened, I had an opportunity to um, have a really stable job in a corporation that, so I'm also um, a fitness instructor. Right. And it is something that I have always kept in my life. Mm. Um, it was helping my, because I wasn't dancing anymore. That was my outlet, you know, yes. for movement. So I did lots of different types. Um so, you know, I, I went into fitness and then all of a sudden there was an opportunity to be a manager. So to work with fitness instructors yes. and, uh, so a huge pull from the inside of me was like, yes, you have to do this, Yeah, which was interesting because it was not anything I had to do with being an entrepreneur. It was, it was a big corporation and, but I knew I had to say yes. You know, when you know that, you know, mm. We call that clear cognizance. Mm, absolutely. So, so I did it, and that was where I 
um, everything fell apart. Everything fell apart. And that's where my healing journey started and where the beginning of my current business would start. Mm. Um, so the stress level was high. Um, I did not get to be with people that, that was my, that was my ability. I, like I was telling you at school, I was the daydreamer, the one looking up in the sky, making up things. You know, I was the, the person, I was the floater at school. I would go and go from the, the, you know, the, the guys were like hard punk, you know, into the, the, the nerds to the hippie. And I would float all by myself and I would get along with all of those people, <laughs> Uh, you know, and mm. it, I was, it was a street, um, the street smart. I was, that's what I was. Yes. And, um, and I was hoping in that role, that's what I would do. And then I ended up, it was full of, of rules. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that was a great catalyst. It, it, it taught me uh, lots of tools that I had need that were, that were needed. And I mean, tools, practical tools, but also tools from the inside to be able to go into my business that I'm currently in. And what happened is that I went into a total burnout. Um, and the burnout ended up not being only a burnout. I did not even know I had a burnout. I continue working mm, yeah. because most people are like, well, I'm tired too, you know, but that's how the way it is. Yes. You just, you just gotta, you know, buckle up and go and buck up. I mean, I, you know, it's kind of like that, that expression. Yes. I was like, okay, I guess that's what we do. Okay. So I went with it and good Lord, that was, that was not it. That's not what I was supposed to do. And, um, then I started having panic attacks. Um, and that started in 2015, actually in November, 2015. Oh my God. Look at that. We're in November now too. Mm, two, years. two years later. Wow. So, um, it's kind of coming full circle. It's interesting. Yes. And panic attacks, anxiety to a level I have never experienced. And then we went, you know, to the doctor and all that and started to tried to see because it was not getting better. No. I would not sleep for uh, about for two months. I had zero sleep. Like, I mean, zero sleep. Wow. I, everything was off in me. And then I, what was happening, my thoughts, they would not stop. Everything was playing the worst scenario. Everything was telling me I was doing something wrong. And I was diagnosed with OCD. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're not talking OCD, ch checking the tap or checking the doors. It was OC OCD with your thoughts. It was intrusive thoughts, you know. The best way I can explain it was often we talk about post-traumatic, um, so, uh, sorry, not post-traumatic, but um, um, and it's slipping out of my mouth. Mm. But, uh, you know, when women are uh, pregnant and they have a um, postpartum depression. There we go. Mm. And sometimes they can get all of a sudden intrusive thought of they, themselves looking at their baby and seeing them hurting them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that what was going on in my head. I started to have these intrusive thoughts about so many things, and I started believing them. I started not knowing was what I was didn't know what was real and what was not real. Um. I lost everything. I could not get out of the house. Mm -hmm. I could not sleep. My, I was losing weight and I was already quite small. Um, and I was losing weight like so fast. Um, I was losing everything in that. that I mean, my, my work, I couldn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. I was home, left alone, sitting with my thoughts. And they were not good ones. No. And then I was also diagnosed with PTSD um, coming from my childhood and from my younger years. Right. Yeah. So it and was. That's, that's sorry to interject that. Yeah. It's, yeah. And, and remember where you where you left off. But it, it's really interesting that how old were you when all this happened? So. Um, 
That was two years ago when I was 38. Mm. So it's interesting that if things happened in your childhood and they have taken mm. so long to bubble yeah. up and come to, you know, yes. to the front um, and the PTSD. And I think there is a lot of that that I'm hearing about these days where mm -hmm. people may have gone through stuff in their younger years or mm -hmm. even more recent years, but they don't realise that they've suppressed some of the feelings and some yep. of the pain and the hurt. And at some stage, it has to come out. And, yes. And what I suspect, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not an expert on this by any means, but I suspect some of that then at that age, in those years, it had to come out um, yeah. for you to go through some healing crisis. Yes. It was. Uh, it was absolutely totally needed, mm. and I thought, I thought I was going along with this. And, and I was okay for the longest year. I was, but what I didn't know was just coping. Mm. Um, and it comes to a point, and I believe everybody that that's my my belief, and that everybody comes to, like you said, a certain point where we are being faced with an opportunity of being able to shed layers that came from conditioning and limited beliefs, you know, from either from the way we were raised, our parents, from our ancestors, even generations, mm -hmm. from society, you know, and then you realize it's just not working anymore. And then mm -hmm. you are faced with a choice, a choice. And I call that, and that's something that I've learned in therapy. It's choice point, you know, choice point up or choice point down. Mm -hmm. Choice point up being choosing to heal, choosing to face, choosing to, even if you don't even know what it is, to actually go deep into it and to decide to look at it. And choice point down being coping, where you actually just exist and suffer. Yeah. Um, so, and I knew deep down inside, at the beginning, all of this was very difficult. It was so difficult that I... Um, I came to a point where I had decided when, where, how I was about to do it. My husband walked in. I was going to commit suicide. Oh. And that was about a year and a half ago. Um, not a long time ago, you know. No. And, and I did not want to leave. That's what it is. I just wanted the suffering to end. Yeah. I did not know who I was anymore. Mm. It's like everything was chaos and breaking apart and down and I was left on my knees with nothing nowhere to go you know I couldn't go lower and um and that started the beautiful journey it was the most difficult and the most beautiful thing that could have happened to me yes then a realization that this was needed for me to shed layers all of those layers of untruth about myself yeah because where truly I was being called um, in my heart and where my abilities lied and the reason, my life purpose, why I was here on earth, uh, could not go forward. I could not go forward in that place with the old. Um, and I'll give you an example, you know, like... Um, one of them was, I've always been a very hard working person and yes. I took pride in that. I was a hard, hard worker because my dad was a hard worker. My dad came from a, a very big family of um, like more than 10 kids, you know, like, wow. <laughs> and so did my mom. They were about 13. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh no. And my great grandma, listen, I had 24 kids. Oh my God. Here come, yeah, French Canadians. Here we go, eh? Oh my God. But, oh yeah, yeah. Like, how can you have 24 kids? That's, I'm like, I don't even want to imagine, good Lord. That's oh, incredible. I know. And I don't have any, you know? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So there was generational of, and my dad was the oldest man uh, of that family. So he learned about working hard. They never learned about sitting down, taking, like never. It was about, you grow, then you go work. He was 15 when he left home, mm. started to work and would send home probably three quarter of what he made for money to his home. Yes. 
Um, so I watched my father and I was like, all right, that's how it goes. And I started to do the same thing. Um, and then I realized, oh my God, this is so not true. Not everything needs to be hard. I don't have to work hard at everything. Mm. If I worked up, if I did something and it felt easy, it was almost like, well, I'm doing it wrong, you know? Yes. And then it changed into, what about we change hard work for hard work? Mm. And that's what I started to do more, like more it. the hard work. Yeah, you know? love it, love it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. I shed layers like that. Like, that was not my truth. It was a truth from somebody else that was not mine. And one of the biggest truths that I needed to shed, and I'll be honest, I'm still working on that one, is that I believed for the longest time I was a bad person. Oh. And that comes from um, my childhood mm. where I had, I had great parents. Um, they did what the best that they could. And, um, but there was a lot of things that happened that were really traumatic. And every time I was there. Mm. So as a kid, kids do not make sense of things the same way adults do. No. And as a kid, what I registered was something bad happened. I'm here. It's my fault. Every time I'm around, something bad happens. Yeah. So I'm a, I must be a bad person. Mm. So I was, you know, I went on with life thinking I was a bad person and also that I wasn't important. And the reason for that one, and that took a lot of work to just realize all those things, right? Mm. Um, was that my older brother is about a year and a little bit, um, you know, older than me, uh, was born with the umbilical cord around his neck and oh, lost so oxygen. Oh, so did you? Yes. Yeah. Wow. And I was, oh, sorry to interrupt you there. But wow. Yeah, my I was... Um, I'm a twin and my, my sister is five minutes older and they didn't even know my mother was having twins. So when my <gasps> so when my sister was born, they went, oh, hold on, your your tummy There's hasn't another got one. there is another one in there. We better get him <laughs> out. And then I was born with the umbilical cord. I didn't suffer any oxygen loss, but wow. I yeah, I did have the cord around my neck. Wow. I think it That's was my so sister who tried to kind of get me. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Probably. All right, we're gonna we're gonna un we're gonna get that around your neck yeah. off, so we can help you get out. You know. <laughs> so that's that's really sweet. Oh, I love that you said that. Mm. Um, so my brother though did not have that chance, and he lost. Uh, he did not have enough oxygen, oh. so he was born. And I never know. And a pardon me for the English way of saying this, because I want to be proper about this, but. Um, um, would you say special needs or are mentally challenged and physically challenged? Yeah, special, what would be the proper way to special yeah? needs? Yeah, it's perfect. It's okay, good. thank you. Yeah, um, so it affected him in every way. Um, so my brother, you know, he's right now 41, and um, but he has the mental age of probably a five year old. Um, physically, though, it's interesting because he's a tall six foot, six foot man, tall mm. and, you know, very large and, um, and, but sweet soul. And, mm. um, yeah. So when I was a kid, though, I was the one, every time something would happen in terms with my brother, of course, they had to go to my brother first. So I spent a lot of time being asked to just wait a little bit. Yeah. And being pushed to the side a little bit, you know, mm. um, and I learned that for a long, long time, you know, um, and I did it and I understood it. I understand it now as an adult, but as a kid, then it recorded as I must not be important. You know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes. So all of those things happen. And I lived also my, my family is quite, I like to call it very colorful. Um, my uh, mother, um, um, had was diagnosed with bipolar, and that was a very uh, difficult childhood. Mm. With that, um, the never knowing uh, what am I supposed to? Because they were very unpredictable, right? Yes. So the safety part of things was affected in my body and in me. The not knowing, the fight or flight, you know, was on right away. Um, so, and she ended up very being very ill and. Um, 
And then I have my younger brother who is adopted from Haiti. Right. Um, and uh, he was six months when he came to Canada and I was nine years old. So here we were, you know, having this this family of whew, so so much opportunity for growth. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I learned I learned compassion. I learned about learn, loving differences, you know, uh, bringing people together and and not actually noticing differences truthfully yes and uh that was a great gift and but things got hard and my mom um was very ill and uh one day she just walked out the door um and i have this image in my head and it's very clear i remember that Mm. she was cooking dinner and uh it was me and my brother and she said, I'm going to cook dinner and I'm going to leave. And then I was like, okay. I said, and I was young. I was in my probably 14 years old. And, um, I said, okay, you're going to go to the grocery store, you know? <laughs> and she said, no, I'm leaving forever. And I'm like, what? Oh my God. So I call my, yeah, I call my father. My father came home and then it was just one of those, it's like I can, I know exactly where everybody was placed. I remember exactly the words. I remember everything. And in the middle of all of it, uh, you know, I, I was standing. So, you know, we were talking about trauma and the body. Mm. Interestingly, my father was on one side of the, the room and my mother was on the other side. And I was in between. Right. When the back and forth was going on. So I was oh. in a line of fire, mm. right? Mm. Um, and my mom just left. She took her suitcase and left. And so there was a lot of anger that came up with that. And, you know, um, so that was one of the things. And then a few more happened. My dad, a few years later, had that brain aneurysm. So we did not have a mom at that point. So... I became the caretaker very young at 14 years old. I was, you know, helping the boys. I was with the boys. Yes. So take care of my brother, you know, being here with him. I would do, you know, everything that a mom would do and and a wife. Mm. Uh, My dad is a construction worker. And he, at that time, and then, no, that was in the 19, probably uh, early 90s. There was not a lot of single dads, you know? No. Um, and my dad took that role on, and it was very important to him. And But he had to work to make sure we would survive. We were not very rich at all. Mm. I remember eating a lot of mashed potatoes and uh, ground beef, I tell you. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for gravy. Mm. Um, but um, so that happened, and then when my dad had his brain aneurysm, then I, I took care of him, and... So a lot of my dreams, a lot of everything I wanted got put aside. Um, And there's more, you know, of traumatic events that happened throughout the years, but they lasted all the way, you know, to 30 years. So that was a lot to heal, you know, at that moment where everything was breaking down when I was 38. That was a lot to to look at. And I was determined once I realized that that's what it was Mm. um, to head it, head, you know, to face my fears, to do it and do the work. Um, so that was my full-time job. And I was very lucky to have a husband that, um, that you know, stood by my side every step of the way. Um, they, they're, they're, it's, I can't even explain the things that he's seen and heard. And, you mm, know, mm. Um, it, was, it was pure hell on earth. And at a point, I had made a choice. I, I actually made a conscious choice of staying oh, f- and not leaving that's brilliant i'm very pleased about that. <laughs> yeah thank you for making that choice and i'm delighted to be speaking to you Aww, and, and you. you know of course that all of those things that you've gone through with your family mm-hmm. and even the people that you've met outside of your family was of course and I can say this to you because of what you now do and what you understand. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's what you chose to experience when you came here. Exactly. Uh, And you wanted to experience this and you had to experience it in order to get where you are today and have the empathy to be able to help others 
who are going through these trials and tribulations because you know what it feels like. Exactly. Yeah. And you can empathize with people so much better mm -hmm. that way. Absolutely. Mm. It's uh, what I did pretty much is that I went to school. For, mm. you know, mm. I went to school and I went to school about myself. I went to school and what I did during this healing period was gathering tools. I was just gathering tools. And when I kept seeing, seeing it that way, mm. knowing that, uh, and that's where the idea of wanting to so go into um, now the healing business. And people are probably like, what is she doing? She hasn't said that in yet. <laughs> So, so what I do is that I'm a healer. Yes. Um, and, and I do energy work. Um, um, I help um, everybody, so adults, um, but I also work with children. I have a lot of young people that have um, abilities that are very sensitive, highly sensitive and empath that get diagnosed, you know, with with anxiety, depression, ADHD, and, yes. and it's not that part of it is not true, mm. um, you know, but I will say that, and I'm not a doctor, but from my experience and working with this and being one of them, <laughs> absolutely. often it's because those kids are just extremely sensitive. They feel energy in a way that a lot of people cannot even imagine. Mm. Um, they they do not just feel you know emotion for someone. They actually absorb the energy. We call that being an empath. Mm. Um, it is very difficult to live that when you don't understand it and you don't know how to work with it and how to to understand that it has to be. It has actually is one of your superpower. That's what I tell the kids. Yes. So my role is to teach them first of all what they are and how amazing and beautiful and needed that they are. Yeah. And then to teach them techniques, techniques on how to take care of themselves, techniques that I have had to learn. Um, and then I also work with um, animals. That's one of my huge passion. Yes. Uh, I'm a energy healing with animals and an animal communicator as well. Um, Brilliant. And, and I love, love, love it. And I also work with the arch with the um, angel, uh, angelic realm. Mm -hmm. So um, what people would call psychic, but I, I, I don't like that term. Mm. Um, I really do. Again, I believe it's an, I'm a healer and not a psychic per se. Um, what I do is that I'm just a channel. I'm the vessel. Um, and what I do is that I listen to people's garden angels and archangels or any other spirits that are around. It could be people who, you know, have crossed over. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then what I do is just pass along the messages that are healing messages. Mm. So I don't do the old way of psychic where people would tell you you're going to get married in three years and have like two kids. And what I wanted from the beginning was to create something that would not create a codependence with people, but actually empower them and give them tools. And one of the best thing that happens is when a client leaves me and tells me, thank you. I have everything I need. I can now do it on my own. Perfect. And, th and that's, yeah. that's brilliant because this is where, where things aren't being resolved for individuals because, mm -hmm. as you and I know, um, the teacher will appear when the student is ready, number one. <laughs> and mm -hmm. number two, when people take on the teachings of the teacher, and interpreted in their own way and mm -hmm. then start their own journey of self-healing, mm -hmm. then they stand a much better chance of achieving it rather than being reliant on a healer um, yes. to do it to them. You know, lots of people walk around, oh, I need healing. Please do healing to me, <laughs> Yes, you know, so I can carry on. <laughs> Rather than, and this is what I love, what you're doing is giving them the tools. You may have to do some intervention to begin with, 
to open oh, yes. to open them up. But once you give them the tools to do it for themselves, that is just the best way of doing it. So well yeah. done you. Yeah. And I've had what I do. So also is once, just like you said, once they have, I know they've had some tools. We've had some sessions together, you know, mm. and then I get some questions all of a sudden, like I start getting questions from them and I know they know the answer. They're just, there's fear somewhere in there. And I say, and that's where I answer back with a question. You know, I don't go anymore with trying to give them um, another tool or because mm. they have it already. Mm. I go back with a question and then it makes them go back inside of them. Yes. And often they come back to me the day after and be, oh my God, I got it. This is what you meant. Mm. And I said, yes. So there you go, you know. So so that's what I do. That's now my 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 business. My business is called Leading Light. Um, and I could not see myself do anything else. This is what I call my life purpose. Mm. And it is something that I also, so the clients, so, you know, it's the clients that, sh that, that find you. Um, and that goes for any business that I've learned. Mm. So you can choose to go into uh, a career or you can choose to go into your life purpose. Can your career be your life purpose? Absolutely. That's mm. what I'm doing. Mm. Right. Um, can you also have a career, but still do your life purpose? Absolutely. Like a baker, a baker can be your best counselor, <laughs> not even knowing it. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. You go and you have this baker that's always happy, that's got always great advice. You spend a little longer time. They spend longer time with you. They always end up giving you great advice. Um, the life purpose of that baker is to be a counselor, but the vehicle he uses it is by being, you know, a baker. Mm. So a lot of people do it that way. Um, but a career also in the way that now society is, is often to generate a financial abundance, to be able to generate more <laughs> things that you start to be codependent of. Yes. And then, you know what I mean? And then you start to go into that cycle and the cycle starts to be just a big wheel where all of a sudden you don't know how to get out and you're not happy. Yeah. And then people try to get out of that and get into another job that they don't like. Yeah. You know, so they're coping. Well, the problem, you're right, they are coping. But because a lot of businesses, and, and certainly not all of them, there are some really amazing businesses in the world and not everybody knows who they are. But most businesses are in the game for just one reason only mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. is wealth creation mm -hmm. and growth yeah. and they do that for the shareholders who want wealth creation and growth and therefore mm -hmm. it's not a purpose that is congruent with where the planet wants to go right exactly and therefore it's we're always pushing in the wrong direction we're pushing against <laughs> rather than going towards yeah. And therefore, people that are working for these organizations get unhappy and, yep. you know, they think they need a job because they need the money. And yep. then, then the, the job just only becomes about the money. And then exactly. once you've got the money, they, because society have, has uh, shown them that once you get money, you have to buy stuff to, mm -hmm. show, to show that you've got money. <laughs> You know, and to keep yourself happy too. Yeah. Hey, for, and, you know, and then you buy all the stuff, and then you need more money to pay for all the stuff that you keep buying. You know? Exactly, and exactly, and the things also they give you benefits. So you stay in a job because you want to reap the benefit. You know, the benefits that they want to give you, or that, and mm. because you, if you need to go to the doctor, yes. you know, then. But here's the thing. <laughs> You go to the doctor because you're stressed because your job makes you stressed. That's right. Goodness gracious, like it, it does just not make sense. But I get it because I was there. Yeah. 
Yeah, so was I. I did yeah. that. You know, I was there. And now that I'm awake, it's like, oh, thank goodness. And now, now that I'm awake, it's like, oh my God, let's help as many people as we can. And not as many just people as we can, but also the ones who are ready, because you have to be ready. And like you said, is all of a sudden you get pushed, you know, you get pushed into that place where you're uncomfortable, you're not happy, you're not all of those things. And this is the moment right there where often things just explode. You lose, just things explode in your life. Yeah. You lose a lot. But what's the beautiful thing about that, and in my case, what I realized is that my life had to shatter in a million pieces for me to be able to pick up only the ones that I wanted. Yeah, yeah. And create from that the life that I wanted and the, I call it a business. And mm. yes, it's a business, but it's more than that. You know, like I said, it's the life purpose part of it. And, and what was interesting though, in healing world and the healing arts, um, there's that question about, should we get paid or not for what we do? Mm. Mm. Um, and in truth, in my truth, because everything I'm talking and telling you today is only coming from my truth. Mm. And I always tell people and my clients, there's a lot of information out there. Always listen um, and then check in with your own self. Does it resonate with you? Mm. Is that part of your truth or not? You know, but my truth was that, um, sorry, I lost. Where, where was I going with that? <laughs> This was about being paid for what you did in the arts. Thank you. Yeah. So, I, I, side note, here it is. So, I am, um, I'm an empath mm. and I feel energy a lot, mm. okay? Mm. And which happens that what happens to a lot of us being very, everything becomes um, <sighs> triggers around us. So, too much lighting, noises, everything. We we hear and feel everything, so we get distracted often. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you say that now, <laughs> often, right? <laughs> I, I know. So now that makes sense. But to my husband, I look like I'm very distracted, and I'm a very clumsy person. But the truth is that a lot of us who are empath mm. and you know very sensitive, there's just so much uh, coming into you. Yeah, that all of a sudden it, you have to come back in, you know? Yeah, I understand. Because while I'm talking to you, I have my team coming in, my angels, you know, coming in and being, okay, we're going to talk about this and this and this. It's like they're, they're, they're in charge here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that was my side note. But Okay, um, thank you. So with the, the paying part of things mm. is that in my truth, yes, because people have to see the value in it. And if people see the value in it, they will invest themselves in it. Yeah, totally. And and that is something that I've learned, and that's something that I've seen a lot of, um, not just in the healing arts. I've seen in businesses, people have great talents and abilities, but just devalue themselves in that way, and not feeling that they are deserving of that piece. And that's important for business owners to understand that. Their abilities, what they have to offer is special. It's their own essence. It's who they are. And they have worked for this. And I'm not talking they've worked only for the certification, you know, for the schooling. They've worked putting it into place in their own life. Yes. They've worked in ways that other people will never understand that actually is work, you know. And I think you're right. And a lot of people devalue that, you know, because mm -hmm. people are just looking at the money on the costing or the quotation or the proposal rather than saying, actually, this person. I mean, when you talk about life's purpose, mm -hmm. people that are in business for themselves, it literally has been a life journey by the time they get to running their own business. Exactly. So it's all of it, especially in your case, listening to your journey, you've invested in all of that heartache and pain and challenges throughout your whole life to get to the place where you can be, you know, qualified, empathetic towards other mm -hmm. people uh, to help them overcome some of their challenges. So, yeah, it's... It's fascinating because 
people judge it just on the basis of today rather than thinking actually this person has had to learn a lot, has had to craft their skill. Yes. Uh, for many, many years, if not decades, before they got exactly. here. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and and yes, you know, when I was young, I I was always I had the abilities were always there, you know. And when I talked to, about abilities, so what I'm able what I'm able to do is that I um when I connect with somebody's team, um, I get to work with my clairvoyance, which means clear seeing. Uh, it's clear seeing, and you clear seeing yeah. is in your third, you know, your um, your third eye, yeah. um, your mind's eye, and um, I'm also a clear audience. So I will hear in the inside of my head my own voice, but knowing it's not my message, <laughs> um, you know. And, um, and I'll also get to feel. So let's say, um, and right now I'm, I blocked it a little bit because you and I are talking, but if I was to open that channel, I would be able to tap into your body, Michael, and be able to see uh, how you are feeling. And I would be able to tap into, if you have a headache, I'm going to have a headache. Mm. If your stomach, if we're talking about a subject that um, is a subject that needs healing, I'm going to feel your heart starting to um, have anxiety. That is my ability. That's how I use my sensitivity to know with my clients that oh, we've just touched something right there that is going to bring some healing and once and answers. Mm. Um, because so clients that come to me m more on the adults, um, often they want to know what is it I'm supposed to do in life? Um, when am I going to meet the person yes. in my life? You know, and, yes. um, when, what about finance finances, yes. you know, I want to be financial abundant yeah. and I'll give you an example. So I had somebody come up, um, and that's very often what comes that way. Mm. People come for finances and they say, I don't understand. I don't know why it's not growing. Like, I don't know. And I have business owners coming to see me as well with yeah. that. Um, and, and, you know, there's lots of people that want to know the answer. Should I start my own business? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And uh, usually if you ask yourself that question, yes, it's a yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know. So, you know, it's if you've had the thought of, know that this is – this is something deeper into in you that is wanting to emerge and bring forward to the world your gift, you know? And so when I'm sitting down with a client and all of a sudden what I'm going to get for them is going to be sometimes um, what they call a little an an angel prescription. Yes. <laughs> so what I'm getting is like, okay, so this person has to spend more time outside. This person has to start uh, be creative, use both of their hands. This person has to also start meditating. And then I share that with them and they're like, well, I don't understand. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, same thing with a lady. I remember a lady coming to see me. When am I going to find that person for me mm. and I tapped into her team and she, what came up is that she needed to change her nutrition <laughs> her the way she eats and she's like I don't understand I'm like let me explain to you what you eat ch changes your energy mm. changes your vibration mm. just like for money if you go outside you change your vibration, you become more clear. Mm. Um, if you start to meditate, the same thing happens. And then you deal with not um, things from the outside, but you deal with yourself. Yeah. And then you can find your answers. And your vibration rises to the level where you're meant to go, you know, to the level where the person you're meant to be with maybe is already ready for you, but their vibration is higher. They've done some work already mm. and you have to rise your own vibration to come to the same level to see each other. Yeah. Um, and often I'll share that actually with business owners is that it's a great tip is that decluttering is one of the best tool for financial abundance. Mm. 
I totally and, agree with that. Mm-hmm. There's a shift not that's energetic that happens. And it doesn't mean you have to go in your house and go crazy and clean everything. And that's what I share with my clients. Start with your purse. Where do you put money? Mm. In your purse or in your wallet. Start to clean that. Once in a while, start to open a drawer, you know, and I'm sorry, I can't say that word. Drawer? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Good Lord. And and clean that up. Mm. Everything you clean and that goes, leave a space for the new to come in. So, Marie Helene, have you seen the minimalism uh, movie? I I have not. Please tell me about it. Oh, okay. So, do you have Netflix? I do. Okay, so this, you will love this. (laughs) Um, So please check out, and anybody listening, check out uh, a documentary called Minimalism uh, by uh, Joshua Fields Milburn and Ryan Nicodemus, Nicodemus, I think he pronounced it, two American guys who've gone on this journey. They were all mega stressed out working Mm. for a um, phone company in America. And anyway, they've become the minimalists and they come out with some really amazing stuff. Uh, They have a podcast as well uh, called The Minimalists and they do some really great. They have a a website called Minimal Maxims where they have lots of these quotes and things. And So cool. It's it's so amazing. And, And exactly what you've just shared is... You know, if they're not talking about having to get rid of everything, but it's about valuing the things that you have mm-hmm. and, you know, getting in touch with yourself and why do you need all this stuff around you? And it's blocking yep. the energy and everything else. And and I've always realized that I, I'm a minimalist, but mm-hmm. I didn't fully realize it until I found them. And a friend of mine who listens to the podcast, so I'll mention him, Petros, Colas, um, and he introduced me to this uh, documentary. I'm eternally grateful to him because it has changed my outlook on the amount of stuff that I need in my life, which is very, very little now. Yeah, yeah. So, and there's there's something also about understanding that when you're in touch with yourself and you follow your passions. Um, that's when the abundance kick in. Mm. It's backward. Um, often people say, I will do this when I have the money. I will start my own business when I have the money for. Mm. No, no, it's, it's, it's baby steps. You can still be in, okay, let's say, you know, somebody is in there. Um, and that's something I help a lot of people do is that transition. You are in that corporation, right? You're in a big business. You're in a role. You're not happy anymore. Mm. You have this lovely idea about your own business. How do you go from one to the other? That's a huge gap. That's yes. scary, yes. right? And what I've learned myself, but also seen over and over again is you just start baby steps. That's all it is. Mm. It's baby steps. You don't even have to take a step. Actually, you can just lean into it, you know, Yes. <laughs> like you can start by, um, starting to read more about what you're passionate about and want to, to do. You can start to have fun and just be creative and be like, okay, what would my logo look like? What would my business be called? Mm. Um, all of that stirs energy that will start to move you more and more towards your own business. And then you start to, um, and most people, you know, of course, it's money and time. They're like, yeah, but I don't have the money and time to start doing more on one mm. side. And that's where the decluttering comes in. It's not only decluttering in your home. It's starting to declutter what activities are you still doing out of habit Yes. that truthfully do not serve you anymore? Mm-hmm. What are people in your life that you spend time with that truthfully you just do it because you feel you have to, but your lessons have been learned on each side and it's time to go? Yeah. All of that, remove that. That's more time there. Yeah. And then that time you spend it on something else that you are passionate about 
And slowly and slowly, you start to see, like, then all of a sudden you can start to, um, let's say, you know, in my case, I'll talk about my business because I, I know it. But mm. all of a sudden you start to go and you buy a deck of cards, Oracle cards, and all of a sudden you're practicing with your family. Mm. And then you become really good at it. Then you put a little bit of money aside because you have saved some. You've had time to do that because your job that you're in is allowing you to do that. So it's not to see the job that you're in currently as something terrible and bad, change your perspective and see it as your, your um, abundance to be able to move into the other one. You mm. know what I mean? Yes. It becomes that. And then you all of a sudden have a little bit more money and then you take a course. And from the course, then you plunge a little bit and you start to offer here and there your services and you go to your pace. And I'm telling you, I mean, what was I telling you? At 38 years old, I had lost everything. Yes. You know, yeah. I wanted to go. And here I am. I have my business now. Uh, that's, that's what I do. That's my everyday job. Mm. This is what I do. I can't, and I can't believe it. I am amazed by this. And I followed, I followed this recipe that I'm just telling you. Yes. And the thing is, what's so amazing is you've created it yourself, you know, mm -hmm. and one step at a time. There's a there's one other little tip for people that are listening, and I'm I'm very much into storytelling, and that's why I do this podcast. <laughs> and um, I've been watching some TEDx videos to yeah. get better at storytelling myself, and there is a great one. Uh, by a lady called Patty Dobrowolski, right? If people search for Draw Your Future, uh, she teaches you, it's little, a 10 minute video, she teaches you to draw your future where you draw your current reality or current state on one mm -hmm. side of a piece of paper and on the other side of the piece of paper, you draw the future reality or the reality you want to go to. And then mm. you only choose three steps to go from the one to the other place. And you decide on just three actions. That's all. Don't become, you know, don't think about a massive business plan and, you know, employing people. Just go yeah. from the one, just, to, just choose three steps for now that you want to take. Yes. And then once you take those three steps, you'll get another three steps and then another exactly. three steps. Exactly. And... So and then you have momentum and exactly yep. as you've just described. Yeah. Which is fabulous. It is, it is. And it really does work. People get into their head so much, you know, and they have to drop into their heart more because in their head all of a sudden they go into details. Yeah, but what about this? But what about this? What about this? Mm. Like, it's like, no, stay in the present, which is where the meditation helps, you know, to help you move into your business. And a lot of the details you're worrying about, uh, they will take care of their own, by the way, most of them, mm. you know, and some of them won't, but you'll get the answer when you're ready. Um, it, that takes, that takes trust. And that's the part also that people have a hard time. And, um, I remember I have a story for you. You like stories, right? Yes. So, um, I remember when all of a sudden I, um, so the first step that I did to start my business was not any action steps other than going into my heart and being having a sacred yes. So what it meant to me, it was like all of a sudden I had made a commitment to myself and said, yes, this is what I want. This is what I want to do. Yeah. I commit to this, not knowing how to go about it. You don't need to know how to go about it right away. All you need to do is an intention and a real yes from your inside, you know? Perfect. So I started that. So I said, yes. And then there's this course that all of a sudden shows up and I'm like, oh my God, I need to do this course. <laughs> it was a course with Doreen Virtue in California in oh. person with it. Oh yeah. In person with her. Yeah. And I'm like, and it was, it was quite an amount. I had to travel and all that stuff. And I was like, I have to do this course. And I'm like, okay, I don't have the money. All right. Okay. Let's not panic. I said, I said, okay. Um, I see this. Yes. From my heart. I want this. 
And then I started to ask. So I'm really into about asking the universe, you know. So I asked the universe, I would love to go to this course. I would love to ensure that I have the funds to do it, that come to me, and that I have exactly the amount that's needed. And um, I always add at the end of my um, request, I guess I can say, um, this or something better and for the highest good of everybody involved. Mm. So I know I'm going to get the best of the best, right? Mm. Because I'm going to get either what I want or even Something better. better. Yes. Hey, <laughs> that I haven't thought about. It's you a win-win. <laughs> exactly. Yes. It's like buy one, get one free. Yes. So I said that one week later, um, I get an email from my boss that I was, I was still working, you know, at that point. And She's like, oh, you're eligible for a beautiful bonus. We're so happy you've done a great job this year. And uh, here come. Well, the amount that I got, Michael, was the exact amount of the what oh, I needed. Not God. just for the course, but for the traveling, for yeah. what I had put for the, for the money to eat, everything. It was the exact amount. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I know people are like, oh, that doesn't happen to me, right? Well, I was one of you, if that makes you feel better. Yes. That did not happen to me either. That's right. And those things just, they do happen. Mm -hmm. And for people to see themselves a little bit more like, um, I remember it when I was, I didn't have a lot of money and I was young and I was uh, on my own and all by myself in a city with no family and um, on a very tight budget. And I was not worried, though. Mm. Interestingly, this is not a block that I have. Mm. I was not worried financially. Mm. I always knew that I was going to get exactly what I needed when I needed it. And um, I've always seen myself, the image that I've always had is like a bird. A bird that's out there flying and living and all. Do not die from not eating. Mm. The universe provides to them. Yeah. It's always there, yeah. right? Yeah. They have to do some action to get there. Fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. They have to travel. They have to do a search. But, you know, it's there. Mm. And I've always thought my, myself in this life being the same. I'm like a bird. I, I've always had exactly what I needed. Not, more, not too much and not, not enough. And that being okay with that, accepting that and working from that place um, brought me more and more all the time. Perfect. And I did not focus on trying to make more of that, you know? Well, Marie Helene, it's just amazing to hear your story and your advice is just perfect for people listening that are sitting on the fence, deciding whether or not mm -hmm. they want to start their own business or whether it's the right decision or, when will they have the money to do it? Because you've just mm -hmm. shown that if you set the right intention, then it will happen. But you need to you need to go, as you said, don't make it hard with a D, but make mm -hmm. it go into your heart instead. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which I love I love that. So listen, we've we could chat for hours about this topic. I know. <laughs> literally. <laughs> and I'm I'm sure you have plenty of other things to do. So I'm going to very sadly draw too close, but I just want to say thank you so much for everything you've shared with us today. And and I'm so delighted and overjoyed that you've decided to stay with us on this planet. And Aww. because it's a much place, better place with you on it. Oh, thank um, you. And the last question I have for you is mm -hmm. if people like to know more about you or perhaps speak to you directly, how can they mm -hmm. get in touch with you? Yes. So you can. So I'm a very minimalist, as you say. <laughs> <laughs> so my website is the like this, the saddest little website in the world, uh, because truthfully, I, um, I don't need much. I just put exactly what needs to be there. So Perfect. if you go to my website, it is um, leadinglight.ca. And um, so it's all in one, uh, all together leading light. And uh, you'll see links on there that go to my Facebook page, uh, which is actually um, 
uh, facebook.com slash leading light healing mm -hmm. and which is where I work out from the most. So yes. actually my main tool is, has been Facebook. Um, and, um, on my website, you'll have also a link to my blog where you can, uh, see a little bit more about my journey, um, from the moment that I was uh, ill into this journey of being in this gorgeous business that I'm in. And, uh, yes, you can also call me people. I love people that call me. Mm. I really love to chat as you can see. So, um, I'm in Canada, of course. So if you're outside of Canada, it would be a beautiful one in front of that, but it's 613-261-2424. And I put lots of stuff on my Facebook page, but, um, I am here to be of service and that is my, uh, main goal. And I want to thank you, Michael. This was, uh, beautiful, um, gorgeous opportunity and lots of gold in this. And I'm so, so, so grateful. Oh, well, I'm, I'm the one who's really grateful that you've taken the time to share your story and inspire others to, to do something with their lives, something interesting and inspiring and find their life purpose. So bless you for coming on the podcast. And I'm sure we'll speak soon. I'm going to watch some of your Facebook videos. I've, I, I must share with the listeners this. If you go to Marie Helene's uh, Facebook page, there's some videos on there that have had uh, over nearly 12,000 views and, uh, and they're long videos as well. So that you'll get some <laughs> really great, amazing stuff, uh, on there as well. And some other knowledge from you. So amazing. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll speak again very, very soon. Sounds good. Au revoir. Au revoir. <laughs> so, like, as you've seen, I work with the uh, angelic realm. That's the closest realm I'm with for now, you know, mm -hmm. as everything changes. Um, and they had been bugging me for the longest time. Like, you need to do a channeling. You need to do a channeling. And I put it off for, like, months. And at some point... I was supposed to have a client, the client never showed up. And then I heard, um, this is perfect time for channeling. I'm like, Oh my God, you guys. So, and that's, that's my spirit team, right? I'm like, okay, let's do it. And I did it. Um, that was the first one. And I could not believe the views that I had. I was like, what is this thing? Like I never expected. I thought it was going to be three people. <laughs> And then I did it again. And then I, the last one that I did, I was like, holy moly, it's wonderful what happens when you have no expectations and when you do it f out of service, you know? Mm. It's amazing because it's quite a long video and you would never mm -hmm. have thought, I don't know, people may not have watched the whole way through, but even so, of course. even so people have clicked on it. They've watched a little <laughs> bit, even if it's 10 minutes, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's fabulous. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. It was pretty, yeah. Yeah. Everything is super fun. And this for me, just being able to chat with you is mm. just one of those opportunities that's been throwing my way from the universe and kind of like, Hey, here's one more thing we can do. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Staying alive. UK. Share your story. 